Hello. Um, pleasure to be here. And uh, I, I thank you to all of you who have uh, stuck it out to the bitter end. Uh, so I am uh, at the Center for Applied Energy Research at the University of Kentucky. My, my teaching home is, is the Department of Chemistry. And my focus is on essentially finding ways to have molecular carbon replace uh, atomic silicon in semiconductor devices. We do flexible flat panel displays. Um, we do bioimaging work. We do uh, white light emitters for solid state lighting. But today I'm going to talk to you a bit about our solar cell work. So what do we want to do? Um, you look at the, the, power, uh, the most popular of our commercial solar cell materials, the crystalline silicon solar cell, the rooftop panels that everyone knows. Decent power conversion, but a very high cost. Uh, also a lot of weight, they're have very, they're very brittle, uh, very delicate. Now as we go down in costs, or we also tend to go down in power conversion efficiency, and you hit something like a more of a silicon, six to nine percent, um, just now becoming common in more niche applications. But what I want to talk about is, is the carbon-based solar cell. Very, very low cost. Power conversion efficiency for modules is still low, but that number is going up almost every year these days. So there's a lot of promise and still a lot of room for improvement in the carbon-based solar cell. And so that's what I want to talk about. Perhaps one of the most interesting things to think about when you're considering inorganic versus organic solar cells is the energy input required in order to make the raw materials for the cell. So if I look at, at, at silicon for solar cells, what I've got to do is I've got to take high quality uh, quartz, silicon dioxide, and I have to take very high quality carbon, coal basically, and heat them at extremely high temperatures, usually in electric arc furnace using carbon electrodes. Uh, people talk about silicon being a green technology. For every pound of silicon, raw silicon I produce, I produce 1.6 pounds of carbon dioxide just stripping the oxygen away from the silicon dioxide. So it's not that green. I'm producing a ton of CO2, and that doesn't even account the amount of, of CO2 produced to generate the energy required to get you to those kinds of temperatures. So there's a huge amount of energy input necessary in order to make these inorganic silicon-based solar cells. If I look at organics, again, you have lightweight, thin form factor, flexible, robust. But the coolest thing, at least in my mind, is that the raw materials could be uh, essentially bio-derived starting materials, products derived from, from corn stover, agricultural feedstocks. Um, so you're not needing this high energy input just to make the solar cell, which makes the payback in energy generation from that solar cell come much, much more quickly. And of course, manufacturing costs are cheaper too. One of the cool things you can do with these active inks is actually do spray painting. So spray painted solar cells, I'll talk to you about those in just a little bit. But this is a very diverse audience, so I thought I ought to at least explain how these exotonic solar cells work and uh, perhaps give you an idea of the design rules we develop to design new materials for using this. So in an organic solar cell, you actually need two different molecules, one that's an electron donor and another that's an electron acceptor. Now, as a photon comes in and excites usually the donor, because that's the one closest to the transparent anode, uh, so I excite an electron from the highest occupied molecular orbital to the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital. If my energy offsets are appropriate between donor and acceptor, that charge can then hop from the donor to the acceptor, and that essentially generates our charge carriers. Now, these charge carriers can migrate down to the electrodes, go into the circuit, run around, and recharge your iPad or power your air conditioner or do whatever it is you need them to do. So a lot of molecular parameters need to be designed very carefully in order for this to happen efficiently. And it's even more complicated than that, because what I'm showing you here is essentially two molecules. Now, let's face it, two molecules are not going to absorb a heck of a lot of light. We actually have to have layers of thousands of billions of molecules. And uh, so when that charge transfer process happens, we then have to worry about charge transport. And once I've separated the negative and positive charges from each other, do they have efficient pathways to migrate through the solid from wherever they were generated to the electrode where they can then be collected and used to do useful work? So from an organic chemist standpoint, there are things that are very, very easy to tune. So the offset in lumo energies between the molecules, yeah, that's a piece of cake. I put a methoxy group somewhere, a cyano group somewhere else, that's easy. The open circuit voltage to the cell is directly related to the highest occupied molecular orbital energy of the donor and the lumo of the acceptor. And open circuit voltage is actually one of the key parameters that fills into the efficiency of the cell. So that's clearly something I want to maximize. And again, as an organic chemist, that's something that's very easy to do. So solar cells come in two basic flavors these days. There's first the single heterojunction. You take your, your transparent uh, anode, 
put your donor down, put your acceptor down on top of that, and then usually a reflective cathode on, on top of all that. The nice thing about these is you can get very high quality films. It's very easy to grow a very good quality, highly crystalline film of, of each material layer by layer, but there's only one interface. And the thickness of each layer is limited by the exciton diffusion length of the molecule, right? If that excitation occurs somewhere deep inside the donor, it may not be able to transport all the way to an interface in order to have this dissociation occur. So it can be a real problem. The more common alternative used these days is what's called the bulk heterojunction. You take the donor and acceptor molecules, mix them together, cast them out as a film, and let them phase separate on their own spontaneously into appropriate sized domains so that you have lots and lots and lots of interfacial area. But it's really difficult to predict what sorts of molecules you can blend together to have this spontaneous self-organization take place. And so that's really one of the tricky things that is in the design aspect of this, looking at, for example, uh, to get the separation, we could have a, uh, crystalline molecules with very different shapes. Uh, we can have one crystalline component, one amorphous component. You have to really design each material so that you get this spontaneous phase separation of donor and acceptor, and not just big clumps of one next to the other, which is very, very inefficient. So the thing we tend to look at in our research is crystal packing. How do molecules prefer to self-assemble in the solid state? And what we're doing on this project is how does this desire to self-assemble in a particular way impact its phase separation, the morphology of the film, uh, exciton diffusion length, how well a charge is transported through the solid state. And of course, everyone needs the fruit fly. And in the organic photovoltaic community, uh, that's a blend of materials uh, called poly-3-hexylthiophene, P3HT, and this fullerene derivative called PCBM. So this is the donor and this is the acceptor. You blend these together, spin a film, and this is, um, you know, college sophomores can do this. It's, it's not too difficult to make a solar cell with these two. It's difficult to get a really, really high efficiency. That, the pros can get 3%, 4%. Uh, the, the undergrads can get half a percent uh, on a good day. But you gotta start somewhere, right? So what we wanted to figure out is what sorts of small molecule self-assembly would lead to the most efficient solar cells. Uh, and there are lots of ways that molecules can interact in the solid state. We can get very weak edged face interactions, which are horrible for charge transport. We can get very strong edged face interactions, which are pretty good for charge transport. We can get face to face or pi stacking interactions. Those are excellent for charge transport. How do these different ways that molecules can arrange with respect to each other impact the performance of the solar cell? So we have a, a, a trick we've been using for more than a decade now uh, for crystal engineering solids uh, uh, in, in uh, a variety of semiconductor applications. And we essentially put a uh, solubilizing group separated from the chromophore of interest by a triple bond, carbon-carbon triple bond. Um, I call this a flexible spacer. A lot of people like to think carbon-carbon triple bonds are very rigid. No, they're actually extremely floppy. They bend, they twist, very hysterically undemanding and very flexible. Um, we really prefer to separate the, 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 the morphology tuning group from the electronics tuning group by the spacer because that allows each one to do its own thing. If you attach them directly to each other, you tend to have the, the crystallization enhancing group actually interfere with the electronics of the system. So by separating with a triple bond, uh, you basically have each domain doing what it's designed to do and the material properties tend to be much, much better that way. So for particular applications, we always go through three stages. Whatever problem we decide to tackle, the first thing we look at is the course phase. Do we want to induce uh, intermolecular interactions or eliminate them. And in the case we'll talk today, we definitely want to induce close contacts between the chromophores. Once we do that, it turns out there are lots and lots of different ways molecules can come together. And so we need to screen many, many molecules to figure out which one actually works well with the application at hand. Uh, and of course, the basic science part is figuring out why a particular crystal packing motif works well for an application. Uh, but the more engineering aspect is we'll take it, we'll exploit it, and then we get to the fine tuning. Can we do a little bit of, of fiddling around to really optimize the performance of a particular material? So synthesis, really straightforward. Um, this is so easy. I've actually seen physicists do this. Um, you take thalaldehyde and cyclohexanedione. They said it was like making cookies. You give them a recipe, it works brilliantly. Uh, this is actually an undergraduate lab at University of Kentucky right now. Um, thalaldehyde and cyclohexanedione uh, to make penicillin quinone, for example. You can buy this for like $160 a gram from Sigma Aldrich, or you can make it for pennies. Um, and then add in a thionyl lithium, deoxygenate with tin chloride, and if you do things just right, the desired penicillin will simply precipitate out of solution. 
Um, in the academic lab, we do this up to 30 gram scales. In my startups, we've done this up to two kilo scale before. The materials are very easy to purify by crystallization, very simple to work with, and of course, they're beautiful blue. So at UK, we really love those. So here's what I was saying. By just playing around with the R groups on our, our, our substituent, we can induce a wide array of different crystal packing motifs. These are all from single crystal X-ray structures. We can have uh, materials that stack with slips along the long axis, materials that stack with slips along the short axis, two-dimensional stacking, roughly columnar stackings, all sorts of different motifs. Um, what works? Well, you gotta make the device. That's the only way to find out. So for uh, photovoltaics, we took a very simple approach, bulk heterojunction, uh, we used uh, materials called anthrodithiophenes as our chromophore. We varied the trialkyl group. We used PCBM, which is the classic acceptor. Simple device, uh, indium tin oxide glass. Sometimes we'll coat it with PDOT. Uh, spin down the blend of, of, of donor acceptor, and then it simply uh, evaporate an aluminum cathode on top of that, and, and there's your solar cell. So here's a, the array of materials we studied uh, at the first shot. And so what we've got here are materials that adopt a two-dimensional pi stacking motif. Uh, transitional, you can see that it stacks are beginning to separate out. It's kind of a mix of 1D and 2D. This is strictly a one-dimensional segregated stack and then kind of a very unusual brickwork pattern. Again, we've got four different crystal packing motifs. We make devices out of each one and see what works. And one of the things we found is that any material that had strong two-dimensional uh, electronic interactions gave absolutely horrible photovoltaic response or no response whatsoever. As we started getting into poorer interactions between the molecules, the photovoltaic response began to appear. And then we got to the winner. Um, so in this case, we had a material um, that did some very, very unusual things when we did the spin cast. We blend the fullerene and the, the material in a mixture of toluene and dichlorobenzene. We spin it on the film, and then we put a cap over it so that the solvent evaporates very slowly. And you can actually watch the material crystallize. So uh, as opposed to vapor, after 60 seconds, you see these spherulites beginning to appear. Two minutes, they're bigger and bigger. After about three minutes, they essentially start covering the entire surface. Really cool, really pretty. Um, we won the Sciences Art Competition at the Materials Research Society a few years back with, with these pictures. And these spherulites turned out to be very important. So here are a series of six devices, each with a different spherulite concentration. I know the contrast is low here, you can't see it, so let me darken in. These are the spherulites. I've just kind of darkened in the areas of high crystallinity. And what we find in the devices is that the short circuit current that the device produces is directly related to how much of the device is covered by these spherulites. So all the action is clearly happening in these crystalline re uh, realms. And with lots and lots of optimization and more beautiful pictures, uh, what we found is that we had a bulkhead or junction with slightly over 1% power conversion efficiency, decent open circuit voltage, not a bad current. That was back in 2007. This was actually the, one of the first reported all small molecule bulk heterojunction solar cells. Very, very exciting. Um, the thing that really impressed us is that these anthrodithiophenes have a very short cutoff. Um, they basically stop absorbing after about 575 nanometers. So we're not even absorbing all the way through the visible. And so for the next step, we thought, let's give ourselves a bigger challenge. Uh, let's extend the conjugation, but let's really look at spray painting devices. So very simple. Um, my postdoc took a stone from his backyard and coated it with lacquer just so it was non-porous. And then we painted on silver paint, which you can buy at the craft store. I think Michael sells it. And then we sprayed on the, the bulk heterojunction mixture and then sprayed on a commercially available conductive polymer. And we, in fact, got a solar cell out of this. The power conversion efficiency is miserable, 0.25%. But this is essentially photovoltaic graffiti. The process costs here are essentially zero. The material costs are extremely low. Um, so kind of a power anywhere approach. Now, you know, since uh, it didn't take more than a year for the rest of the field, the field to jump in and take our 1% to 2.3%, and just last year, the Bassan Group at UC Santa Barbara, where I was about 14 hours ago, actually, um, is now, at, they're actually now at 7%. It's not published yet, but they're not 7% for uh, all small molecule bulk heterojunction solar cell. So in just a few years, the, the numbers have jumped and they're gonna continue to do so. It's a very promising area. But one thing we noticed with all these reports is they continue to use these fullerenes. Now, if you remember in the earlier part of this talk, I said one of our goals is to take agricultural feedstocks to make photovoltaic materials. And there's no way you're making these from agricultural feedstocks. 
Uh, you make these by arc evaporation of graphite. And if you actually do the energy balance calculations, it takes the solar cell quite a while to recoup the energy used to arc vaporize the graphite into fullerenes and then purify them and then functionalize them. So we need to find an alternative to, to the acceptor part of the equation. And that's what we've been focusing on for the last few years. So we use our typical approach. Whoops, back. Um, we take appendicine. We do all of our crystal engineering work out here at the trial Cosylo group. We tune the LUMO energy with a single substituent out here. We use, again, fruit fly donor in this case, the poly-3-axyl-thiophene. Very simple device. Again, uh, glass substrate, ITO, PDOT, a one-to-one -one blend of our donor and acceptor, and then cesium fluoride aluminum. And the competing device is between 25 and 3%. So that's the, the target we're trying to get to. One of the first things we noticed is that the position you place the accepting group to turn this into an acceptor has a huge impact on the open circuit voltage. We believe this is morphological in effect. They, they, I don't want to go into that, but um, always when we put the substituent on the two position, we always get a higher voltage than putting the substituent on the one position. No matter what the, the, the substituent is, the two position always wins. A lot of unusual crystal packing motifs. And I want to point out one in particular. Um, so this is what we call the sandwich herringbone. If I imagine a charge being injected onto this molecule, I can very easily hop up here, hop down, hop up, hop down. So I can basically transport in a zigzag fashion in one dimension. I can't hop to the next layer because I've got all this insulating grease blocking me. So what I essentially have here is an insulated one-dimensional wire to transport charges. The nice thing about that is that once a charge gets into it, it's very hard for it to get back out and recombine and essentially be lost. Once it gets in, it's on for the long ride. It's like getting on MARTA, right? You get on at the airport and you just keep riding. Eventually you get to Peachtree and you come off and you're here. So we made a lot of derivatives and that really is kind of the key to our synthetic approach. Once we have a chromophore ready, we can make six, eight, 10, 15 derivatives in just a couple of weeks. And the engineers we work with, which was uh, Yifun Li at, uh, and the Maliaris group at Cornell, did a great job. Let me simplify this table. What I want to point out is that of the highest performing derivatives that we saw, 1.5% being, being the best, all of them had the sandwich herringbone crystal packing motif. Now there are some exceptions, okay? So I, I do want to point out that there is a sandwich herringbone that's a lot lower than the others, and there are a couple of other crystal packing motifs that are reasonably high. So on the one hand, we want to say, okay, clearly sandwich herringbone crystal packing motif is the one we want to chase after, but we've got to explain these exceptions. It really, really was bugging us because, you know, we're synthetic chemists. We like design rules. We like to know what, we, what our targets are. So before I jump into that, let me show you a comparison uh, with P3HD, PCBM. Uh, one of the things we do have in our systems is that because our acceptors ab absorb light out to longer wavelengths, we actually see contributions from the acceptor absorptions to the photocurrent, which is very nice. Um, the other thing we see is stability. Uh, if we look at P3HT PCBM, which is this curve on top here, our other derivatives are roughly the same order of stability. There's one derivative that's actually slightly more stable than the fullerene derivative. So that's another area we can push a bit more. One of the problems with fullerenes is that in the presence of oxygen and light, they generate singlet oxygen, and singlet oxygen is death to the donor molecules. It will tear them apart. Uh, so as you might imagine, a photovoltaic might be exposed to a lot of light and air. Uh, so a molecule that does not generate singlet oxygen is probably going to be a bit more stable than one that does. So as far as the crystal packing, one of the first things we had to determine was, is the crystal packing we see in these cast films, these intramolecular orientation, the same as we get in the bulk single crystal? And we've got two different research groups that have done thin film x-ray studies and said absolutely the only thing we see in these films is the same sort of crystal packing that you get in the bulk single crystal. So that's satisfying. We now know that we can actually compare structures to device performance. But what else? Um, what is it about this particular sandwich herringbone packing that was beneficial to photovoltaics? Can we explain the differences? And what are the exceptions? And this began a nice project with Professor Aram Amasian and his uh, postdoc Ru Peng Li at the King Abdullah University in Saudi Arabia. Uh, and what they found was that there's a, uh, a phenomenon called mosaicity. Okay? And what that means is, in what direction does the crystal grow? If you have very low mosaicity, it means your crystal is growing in one direction. So in all the materials that gave low currents, 
they had almost no mosaicity. The crystals grew horizontally. The charge transport pathway was horizontal. A photovoltaic is a stack device. It needs vertical charge transport, so that's why they all had low current. If we looked at the high current devices, what we saw is they had high mosaicity. The crystals were growing in all possible orientations, which means that you had an assembly of crystals that did transport charge in the vertical direction. So this was kind of an eye-opener, but what we thought was even more exciting was uh, Aram's observation that you look at the unit cell, and all unit cells that were roughly square or cube-shaped had high mosaicity. All rectangular unit cells had low mosaicity. So again, as, as synthetic chemists, we now know, we get the crystal structure, we look at the unit cell lengths. If the unit cell is roughly cube-shaped, then we know, okay, we need to ship this off for photovoltaic studies. If it's not, then we're not gonna waste our collaborators' time because engineers are busy people. It takes a long time to optimize a material. And the way we are characterizing the squareness, let's say, of a unit cell is to take the C-axis length and divide by the A-axis length. If C and A are roughly equal, the C over A-axis uh, ratio will be close to one. If they're not anywhere close to equal, the C over A-axis is gonna be very large. So if I go to that prior table, and show you that again, what we see is that in the best performing cases, so our 1.5% and our 1.28%, we're at 0.96 and 1.05, so very near square. Uh, in this 1D slip stack, again, we almost never see slip stack uh, give good performance. In this one case, we're at 1.2, it gave pretty decent results. The sandwich herringbone that gave a surprisingly low result at a C over A axis ratio of 2.1. Okay, and this uh, 1D herringbone, 0.97, gave a surprisingly high result. So the combination of the type of crystal packing and the squareness of that unit cell seemed to be critical to giving us the kind of transport in the vertical direction that we need for a functioning solar cell. And so we've gone back to a lot of our materials and essentially in every series in it that we've investigated, the materials with C over A axis closest to 1.0 always gives us the highest current. Now, let me say it's not necessarily high in absolute terms, but within a series of molecules, the one with the C over A axis ratio closest to one will always give the highest current. So again, as, as synthetic chemists, this is a great screen we can use to determine what sorts of studies to perform on the various molecules that we prepare. Uh, and so we've applied it to other systems, for example, this anthrodithiophene, um, sandwich herringbone, C over A of 1.2, we get about uh, 0.64%, not spectacular. We see strong contribution of the acceptor to the photocurrent in this case. It's an extremely robust molecule, and we're now working on spray-painted solar cells using that particular material, uh, just because of the robustness of the compound. There's one more thing I want to talk about before uh, I release this to questions. And uh, at, at KAUST in Saudi Arabia, they have this phenomenal, uh, they call it the cave, it's a visualization center where you put on the 3D glasses, you can manipula manipulate molecules in, in real time. And one of the things we, we observed, and what I've done here, is I've taken two crystal packing motifs, I've left the electroactive chromophore part of the molecule dark gray, and then the insulating grease I've painted pink, right? So there's no charge transport through the pink, all the charge transport happens through the dark gray part, okay? So, what have I got? I've got a solution of a polymer and our small molecule, I blend them together, I spin cast a film our small molecule begins to crystallize. What does the polymer see? And that's what we investigated in the cave. And in the case of some classes of molecules, the ones with low photocurrent, what the molecule see is essentially a surface of nothing but insulating grease. That's what the polymer, the donor molecule, is laying down on top of, this ocean of insulator, right? In the case of the higher current materials, when the crystals form, on every surface of the best performing materials, I have exposed pi surface. That's how the charge gets transferred and gets into these 1D wires to then transport this to themselves to one of the electrodes and do the work we need it to do. So that's the next design rule, right? When we look at the crystal structure, we slab it, we always have to see exposed chromophore, exposed pi surface, because the polymer does need to lay down on top of something that it can transfer charge into, and you're not transferring charge into grease. So, sum up, uh, we're currently at about 50% of the benchmark uh, in, in uh, organic photovoltaic acceptors, and we've got very clear design rules now to carry on to next generation materials. I've got a gaggle of grad students and postdocs working, uh, being whipped away heavily on this, uh, but we know how to, to play with unit cell anisotropy, tune the luma energy, and expose pi surface. 
Um, we fortunately were, were blessed with a beautiful new facility out at the Center for Applied Energy Research. Uh, the top floor is photovoltaics, and the bottom floor is shared with batteries and biofuels. Uh, Mark Crocker, who talked earlier in this symposium, is, is on the ground floor. Uh, we're right, right on top of his labs. This is uh, funded by NIST and the Recovery Act. Uh, and then the people who actually funded the research and did the research, uh, many thanks to uh, Office of Naval Research, National Science Foundation, and uh, probably our biggest funding agency is King Abdullah University. Showed you lots of beautiful crystal structures. They were all done by a phenomenal crystallographer, Sean Parkin. Uh, there's a bit dim picture of my research group. There's the gang. And uh, thank you very much. I'd be happy to answer any questions. If you have questions, please raise your hand. Okay. Great talk. I always like to hear about crystal engineering. <laughs> um, it looked like the basis for a lot of the work was uh, certainly the um, end result of the crystal structure. So how much time do you devote to and how worried are you about polymorphism as you scale these up and realize that there could be a thousand different structures for each one that you haven't discovered yet? That is a great question. Um, we haven't discovered any yet. Uh, we've been doing crystal engineering work like this since 2000. And so in the ensuing 13 years, uh, we've found, let's say we have 720 crystal structures and we found two with polymorphs. Uh, so we haven't found any yet, uh, and that's both in single crystal form and thin films. We do a lot of uh, grazing incidents, x-ray scattering, uh, and, and experiments like that to confirm that what we have in the thin film is the same as the bulk crystal. Um, these things really pack tightly. There really is only one way they can go together. In the two cases where we've seen polymorphs, uh, they've both been where the triethyl silo group was unsymmetrical, and so you'd have, say, two small groups and one big one, and one polymorph would have the big one pointing along the long axis of the molecule, and the other one would have it pointing along the short axis. So as long as the trial the solid groups have been symmetrical, we really haven't found any polymorphs. But I am always deeply concerned about having a thin film form of a crystal. And that's why whenever we start seeing interesting performance, the first thing we do is get x-ray analysis to, so we know that when we're looking at the bulk crystal structure, we can actually use that to talk about devices. So you're, that's an extremely important point, and it's something we're very, very careful of. John, I have, I have one question. Okay. So when you uh, make all the, made all the performance of your battery, uh, uh, solar cells, uh, I, I would guess that uh, you already uh, actually uh, optimized the same film uh, thickness and uh, all the other parameters, right? Not really, no. Um, we, I would still say we're in a screening stage. Um, our, our goal is to have what we call a drop-in replacement for current materials. So we are basically using the same optimization conditions that are used for current generation compounds because I don't want to have to start going to my new engineering friends and say, hey, I've got this great new material for you, but you need to start using different solvents or you have to use different anneal temperatures. I really want something I can go to a friend and say, hey, look, you've been using PCBM for a while. Here, just plop this in, do the same things you were doing before. It'll all be fine. Um, so we really, we don't want to do that, any particular optimization. That really is kind of the point of the project. We really want to be able to come up with something that uses the standard optimizations that are currently common in the field uh, and just drop in the replacement. Okay, thank you. Any other question? Hi, thank you. That was a great talk. Um, I was interested, at the beginning you showed a series of chromophores mm -hmm. that were all very different colors. But in the talk, it looked like you were only using a single chromophore, chromophore and just tuning it with, with a functional group. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know if you could comment a little bit more on that. So um, we wanted to focus on the chromophore that would give us the largest amount of exposed pi surface uh, at the borderline of stability, if that makes sense, right? Because as these chromophores get longer and longer, the stability starts going down and down. So we really had to meet that cross point where we're absorbing as much light as we possibly can. So we get the chromophore as long as we can, but not so long that it starts becoming unstable. Uh, so we actually have done some work pushing it ahead to a six ring system, which is deep green, beautiful emerald green color, absorbs a lot more light. 
Um, but that, now we're already starting to see some stability issues with those. So we really are, that, that, that really is what's limiting. Uh, we could certainly go smaller, and in fact, we have goofed off a bit with smaller chromophores. You really have an earlier cutoff, um, but they're more stable. Uh, one of the projects in the group right now is actually combining, so linking three, four, and five ring systems together into a single molecule so we can absorb the bright, broadest spectrum of, of solar influx. Okay, uh, let's thank John again. Thank you.